But here's the kicker. God created these creatures when he didn't have to, while knowing they will suffer this unimaginable pain for all eternity. One cannot argue that God is forced to do this, as it would deny his omnipotence. Nor can one argue that God wants to do this, as it would mean God is malevolent. It is an irreconcilable contradiction. God is not forced to create humans. God does not want to create hell-bound humans. I don't see where the contradiction is. Sheikh Hasra's first response to this question is, He's firstly, Allah does what he wills. فَعَالُوا لِمَا يُرِيدُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give life to whom he wills and death to whom he wills. He can be merciful to whom he wills and punishes whom he wills. This is an appeal to faith and doesn't answer the question. Obviously, if an omnipotent God exists, he can do whatever he wants. But who's to say it's the God of Islam? How do we know Islam's depiction of God is not simply a man-made fiction? What do you mean, appeal to faith? We're literally talking about the Islamic God. Uh, why does Allah send people to hell? Well, you see, in the Qur'an, it says, So Allah can send people to hell if he wants to. Uh, why are you bringing up the Qur'an? What are you talking about? Even if we were to say that Islam is false and that it's man-made, that doesn't matter. Because if you're asking a Muslim, of course they're going to answer you with the Islamic depiction of God. What other depiction of God are they supposed to argue from? God and the afterlife are religious concepts. They don't exist outside of religion. When you talk about God, you have to establish which God. The God of the Christians, the God of the Jews, the God of the Sikhs, the God of the Muslims. And with the afterlife, you have to talk about which afterlife. The afterlife of the Christians, the afterlife of the Jews, the afterlife of the Sikhs, the afterlife of the Muslims. Like, come on. And asserted that life, intellect, and free will is a greater favor than non-existence. The second and more detailed response, which is in the book, is that my argument is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving life, intellect, and free will is greater than, is better and as a favor than the person not existing. This couldn't be more untrue. A life of 70 odd years, followed by a never-ending existence of being burnt alive, is without a shadow of a doubt worse than non-existence. Whatever brief joys one may experience in life, it can never outweigh an infinite existence of torture. I don't think this is as simple as you make it out to be. And this is evident almost daily when it comes to abortion. Let's say we have a baby who we can determine will have a horrible disease and a very short lifespan. Is it better to terminate the pregnancy so that it never experiences pain? Or is it better to give the child the gift of life even though it will suffer? I honestly don't think there even is an answer to this. Sheikh Asrar has a reasonable position of the latter, that the gift of a fleeting life is more merciful than an eternal punishment. Especially in the Islamic framework, where we believe there is evidence of people who were already convinced of hell, yet still preferred a life of evil, despite eternal damnation. They chose this life over the next. God could have given them no life, or he could have given them a bad life. But with his mercy and compassion, he still gave them a life in which they can experience some pleasure. Sheikh Asra then presents a thought experiment, whether to kill baby Hitler. I give a thought experiment. The thought experiment is you travel back in time, you reach a place where there is baby Hitler. You now have the option to kill baby Hitler. If you decide not to kill him, the question is why do you decide not to kill him? The response is very simple, because baby Hitler has the right to life, intellect and free will. If he chooses to kill baby Hitler, then he can never question God when God destroys and kills and when God punishes and when God carries out his divine actions because the knowledge of God is eternal. So if a man with his limited knowledge thinks he has the right to kill baby Hitler, then how can he object to the knowledge of God? If he allows baby Hitler to live, if he allows baby Hitler to live, then he cannot object to God creating baby Hitler because he allowed baby Hitler to live uh, because baby Hitler has the right to life, free will and intellect. So both ways the answer is given. So I actually think Sheikh Asrar made a pretty good argument. Sheikh Asrar's argument is, if we were to play God, we would do the exact same as God. You would punish while being knowledgeable, or you'd spare while being knowledgeable. In theory, you could kill the parents of Hitler in order for baby Hitler to have never been born. That way you would never have to fall into the dilemma of killing or sparing baby Hitler because you'd stop him from being created in the first place. Well, except for the fact that all you're doing is moving the dilemma to the parents. Ad infinitum. The question is, why create them in the first place? Why create him in the first place? From what I can tell, this is really the crux of the argument. If God exists, why bad things happen? You see, the problem with this is that it would be a contradiction if God was required to only create heaven-bound people. 
to which I am unaware of that clause existing. In fact, Islam says that God creates sinful people on purpose. So let's end this with two topics in which I think there is contention and are usul for this issue. The first is God's knowledge versus qadr. Now, despite what some Muslims would argue, I don't believe that Allah's qadr is all-encompassing because then Hassan Rathwan would be right. So let me explain. When I was 12, I was deeply troubled with the concept of qadr. If Allah decreed for me to go to Jannah, I'll go to Jannah no matter what I do. And if Allah decreed for me to go to Jahannam, I'll go to Jahannam no matter what I do. So there really isn't a point in doing anything. The problem with this is that while Allah knows something will occur, it doesn't mean that Allah is the one that is making it occur. As the Quran states, reward and punishment are for what you used to do. Now, let's say that Qadr was all-encompassing and that Allah wrote out your entire life before creating you. Well, then Hassan Radwan would be correct in saying, why create them in the first place? If Allah created for you to go to hell and there's nothing that you can do about it since everything is written down for you, then why not just create you in hell in the first place and why waste time by creating you on earth and giving you this false sense of delusion that any of your actions mean anything? But in my understanding of Qadr, Hassan's question only deals with Allah's knowledge. If Allah created you knowing your destination, why would he? To which this does not contradict God, as to what I said earlier, you see the problem with this is that it would be a contradiction if God was required to only create heaven-bound people. The second is what he spends the last quarter of the video on. How can hell exist without contradicting his mercy? Despite the dismissive stance of these and other Muslim apologists, this is a crucially fundamental question. It goes to the very heart of the nature of the God Islam presents us with, and which we are being asked to believe in. It's a question that has deeply troubled the minds of the greatest theologians and scholars throughout the centuries, including many Islamic scholars. One of these was Ibn Taymiyyah, who towards the end of his life was so profoundly concerned by this question that he felt compelled to challenge the orthodoxy of his day and write a treatise arguing that hell was finite. Firstly, again, despite what some Muslims would argue, I believe that Allah is so merciful that the amount of people that go to hell is minimal. Secondly, now this might be my American-centric view of ethics, but I believe that there are things that people can do that can grant them eternal punishment. For example, life in prison sentences are there for people who have done acts so heinous that they are unable to reintegrate with society, which in my opinion are the hell dwellers that Allah talks about in the Quran, specific kuffar that do so much evil with their kufr that it lands them in eternal damnation. Again, a very small fraction of people to begin with. So, no, I don't see the contradiction. Try again.